This is the Blockade Pimple Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Freebus, a.k.a. Shut Your Trap. Joining me as always, halfway across the world, it's Jared Morgan. Hey, how's it going? Uh, it goes very well, Jared. Uh, we were planning on doing a kind of a, I guess, a Let's Play video uh, this week about uh, the latest offerings in uh, Zen's Pinball Effects. And then uh, instead we're changing things up and we're going to talk to somebody else that's uh, halfway across the world uh, right in your neck of the woods. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I've got a local. we got a local in the show. <laughs> let's, uh, let's go ahead and bring him in. This is uh, David Gilmore of uh, Retroplay, an uh, arcade manufacturing uh, company there in Australia. Hello there. Hi. Hello. What part of Australia are you uh, doing this in? So I'm based in um, rural Victoria. Um, I'm originally from the UK, um, but yeah, based in rural Victoria. Very good. So here's the thing. We now and then see various uh, uh, manufacturing companies with their uh, pinball machines, virtual cabs and stuff. And me and Jerry would always go, ooh, ah, that's kind of interesting. And then it's mm. kind of like, yeah, but we're, it's out of our price racket. And so it doesn't really grab our attention and everything. And uh, the reason why you're on here today specifically is because I saw a video that actually made me go, oh my God, we're going to have to talk about Visual Pinball to X. <laughs> because finally. Finally. All these years. Something that people have been begging us to do, and we're always just like, no, 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 because it's, it's such a mess. It's too difficult to talk about. There's too many things to deal with. Uh, yeah. The installs are a nightmare, and uh, there's you know just a bazillion tables. And how do you possibly filter through all that stuff? And your video that you guys had recently posted, you're building an app. And I didn't realize this was basically for your cabinet. So the thing that I saw was, oh, an app and I can download? No, 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 it's for your cabs, but we'll get into that. But your app, you installed five machines in like three minutes with yes. full back glasses, audio packages, yeah. everything that was absolutely needed, and it was just like a breeze. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it was amazing. I saw it too, and I was just going... What is this sorcery? <laughs> when, when we talk well, about VPX. In all honesty, I can't believe it's taken so long for the community to get to this point. Really, uh, so um, you know, in, in, installing these tables is so tricky, as you as you may know. Uh, it's not straightforward. So there's absolutely a demand for something like this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we're going to circle back to this, but let's get into why it's even a demand uh, for you guys. You guys make arcade cabinets as well as uh, pinball cabs. Uh, for the virtual yes. market. Um, how long have you guys been uh, uh, been around doing this? Um, so I've been building cabinets for about 10 years. Okay. Um, but I've been building specifically in Australia for about four years, which is when I moved to Australia. Oh, and, okay, so you, you had it all set up in the UK um, doing this. Yeah, so I was, I was doing it in the UK at a much smaller level. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm, I'm the kind of, I'm one of those stories of a guy that starts in his garage. Um, so I basically started with no money um, and started building arcade and pinball machines, um, moved to Australia, and it was the same here, started in my garage with no money. Um, and it absolutely took off overnight. Um, went from making one or two cabinets a month to shipping 20-odd cabinets every month now. And, and these cabs, these are all uh, home-use cabs? They're not, you're not making commercial cabs, they're home-use cabs? Or are you doing? Uh, we commercial? do make some commercial cabs, yeah. Oh, wow. um, okay. a, a few years mm. ago, we made. We were asked by Marvel um, to make some arcade machines for the Marvel Stadium in Melbourne. Uh, so we manufactured some arcade machines for those, um, and we actually used the original CPS2 Capcom boards inside the machines um, oh, with yeah. coin mix. Um, so they're currently at the Melbourne Stadium. Um, and then a year after that, we were asked by Hewlett Packard to make. Um, five pinball machines uh, for a product launch. Wow. I was looking at those machines. They were beasts. Yeah, they were beautiful. Really nice. So, yeah, they were, they were really nice. Yeah. So, uh, with the, uh, the pinball cabs there, uh, you've got both mini, mini models, full-size models. You've got a VR model, uh, which... Jared and I definitely want to talk to you about. Um, we're going to get to that <laughs> yeah. in a moment too. Um, what was your primary goal with these machines uh, that you know to separate you out from other virtual cab machines? Yeah, the, the primary goal has been to actually deliver the machines, um, you know, to actually make them and deliver them. <laughs> that is a thing. Yes, yeah, yeah, it's a thing to get them in, you know, in front of people in their games rooms. 
Um, but my whole ethos from day one has been to try and build these machines to be as close as possible to you know the, the mechanical machines. Okay. Um, I'm not trying to make them better. And of course, they're always going to be different. They're never going to be exactly the same as a mechanical mm -hmm. machine. Um, but I'm trying to make them as close as possible. So, you know, we, we if you look at some of the DIY ones on the internet, they have uh, 10 buttons down the front of the machine yeah. and all kinds of weird yeah. lights around the play field and, you know, matrix lighting and stuff. We don't do any of that. I, I'm trying to keep them as close as possible to the mechanical machines in terms of how they play and feel and how they look as well. Mm. Awesome. That's always been the ethos. Right. <laughs> the... Uh... One of the things that, that, that strikes me uh, with your, uh, basically, a lot of your machines there, you've got the diamond plate going on, uh, your buttons, and, and your, your plungers and everything. I mean, it, it looks like it's all real deal kind of deal. And then we start reading about, you know, the guts that are inside of these things in terms of your accelerometers and your, uh, uh, your shaker motors, all that stuff. Um, yeah. Is this stuff that you are sourcing in Australia or are you dealing with having to ship them around? Because I know a couple of your videos you've talked about just obviously the pandemic has thrown everything into a tizzy about sourcing uh, supplies. Yeah. So I'm just kind of curious, how are you guys uh, dealing with that and handling that uh, so that you can yeah. have these things and be able to ship with them? Yeah, I mean, that's the biggest challenge is getting parts in. Um, most, I guess most of the time I try and source parts from within Australia mm -hmm. um, and not just because I'm trying to support Australian business, but because we need the parts quick, you know, mm -hmm. at the speed. Um, so the first point of call is to try and get stuff within Australia, solenoids, shaker motors, uh, plungers. Uh, they're all supplied from people in Australia already. Um, and then if we have to, then we'll go to China or America for other parts but I, I try not to do that where I can because the cost of shipping and delays in getting stuff. Yeah, obviously. So shipping cer is... certainly, certainly the pandemic has been a massive um, learning task you know, in terms of shipping and logistics. Been a nightmare. Been a nightmare. Yeah, I, yeah I, I've, I've experienced firsthand the logistical challenges of trying to get stuff out of the US. It is impossible oh, it's to do hellish, it. Yeah. It's and it impossible. seems to be a new, a new thing at the moment, uh, which we're experiencing, which is very tricky. Is we will tend to, you know, a contact with a supplier who will have 50 plunger housings, as an example. So we'll order the 50 housings, pay for the shipping, and then a week later we'll get an email say we've only got five in stock, oh. we'll ship out five now, and the other. And you know, we've got machines waiting to go out, we're waiting for plungers. And that happens a lot with arcade buttons, plungers, yeah, a lot of stuff. So it's it's tricky, but you know, you've you've got to carry on. Are you um switching? I've uh, noticed that some of the things on your website, um, because you've got not only the the pinball products on your your Shopify site, but you've got yeah. parts as well that enthusiasts can actually buy from you directly. Um, yeah. One of those things was a the the housing for the um, the room sensor that looks three D printed um, to me. Are you yes. experimenting with, with different ways of producing products to try and yeah. keep those logistical challenges down? That's right. Yeah. So we have, we've got a small 3D print farm. We've got five filament printers and we've also got a resin printer as well. So yeah, we had to learn that from scratch basically. And mm. that the idea behind getting the 3D printers was more about customizing the machines, making plungers and making toppers um and, and that kind of stuff you've seen some of our crazy toppers and plungers mm -hmm. um but yeah having the having the 3d printers gives us the ability to make some of our own parts like brackets and you know holders and things that we can't buy elsewhere yeah well, and sense. so you don't have to actually go and spend you know a thousand dollars and being to like you know run of a thousand units for example that's right you know that's right yeah but, but of course 3d printing in itself has its own challenges that's probably mm. for another podcast you know, <laughs> yeah. we, can, we can do a 60 hour we can do a I, mean, I remember actually we made a um a batman um speed racing machine and the guy wanted a a bust of batman on the top with led lights so we actually 3D printed the Batman bust, which took, I think it was four days to print. 
Oh my and God. Wow. about three and a half days in, we had a power cut. Oh. And the, printer oh. could, the printer couldn't remember where it was up to. <laughs> oh, oh so, no. 3, 3D printing does have its own challenges as well. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So next time everything's on a, a, a UPS. I'm, I'm sure anybody <laughs> listening to this podcast who has a 3D printer will know that pain. It's just right. nodding in pain. Probably yeah. going, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. you guys are, uh, with, with regards to the, uh, the cabs themselves, the wood and everything, are you, uh, CNC cutting it, everything there on site? Uh, are you bring yeah, it in uh, we, have a, we have a local partner company who does all the CNC manufacturing for us. Okay. Um, so again, that in itself has been challenging. Um, we've recently changed supplier. Um, but yeah, so all of our cabinets are CNC machined. So like you said, though, I mean, basically as much as you can, uh, source it there in Australia, that's where you're pulling from. Uh, to yeah. put these things together, which is probably, I um, imagine, helping you uh, get through the, the supply chain issue because it's, you know, more local. It is. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, my, my, my full-time job, my, my full-time job at Retroplay has evolved over the years, but really right now, pretty much every day, I just organize parts for the next coming, for the coming builds. Right. That's pretty much what I do full-time because um, that, that's how much effort it's. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just watched a video today. Uh, you guys were talking about uh, switching your manufacturing method to, I believe, it was the, the the Kaizen method or something of that nature. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, wherein you built two cabinets, uh, you know, two player uh, arcade cabinets in three hours, uh, start to finish. How long, and basically what I want to know is what was the method prior to that? Because it looked like you had three people at the same time all working on both <laughs> machines. Um, prior to that, what was the, the normal method of actually uh, manufacturing one of these? So the, no the normal method we have, I've got five guys that work for me. Mm -hmm. And each one of them is more or less a specialist in their own area. So I've got a guy who focuses on arcades. I've got two guys that work on pinball machines. Another guy works on the speed racers. And then there's some of the other products, the dart machine, which we sell less of, which we all kind of fill in and do bits to. So um, before this new method, I mean, and what I would say actually is this new method of manufacturing is a process that we're adopting slowly because mm -hmm. it's quite painful to change. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, at the moment, we're all working on different parts of different machines as and when we've got the parts. So we might get two thirds of the way through one machine and have to stop and then start another machine and then have to stop that machine. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, diff it's difficult and it's tricky with the um, Kaizen uh, manufacturing method. Uh, what we'll be doing is not building the machines until we have all of the parts together oh, ready to go. Okay. And in fact, actually this week was a very good example of that. Um, as you say, two, a week ago, we built the, two arcade machines in three hours yeah on friday a couple of days ago we were actually due to build four arcade machines in one day so that was the next test was to take on four <laughs> machines which we, we we're confident we can do uh, and then right at the last minute we didn't have enough buttons oh um right so it was thursday uh, thursday morning we all waited you know on, on bated breath for the post and the buttons that were due to arrive didn't arrive so that's now been pushed back to probably Tuesday. So, you know, even, even with a new manufacturing method, it has its challenges. But mm -hmm. the idea being is with Kaizen is that we, you know, we basically won't build the machines until we have everything we need. And then we'll work mm -hmm. rather than work individually on machines, we'll work as a team and all focus together and build them out from start to finish. You'll essentially swarm on the task and actually do it. Swarm together. on the task, yeah. yeah. But the, the key is it's reducing waste. That, that's the, the main focus of Kaizen and the lean manufacturing method is to reduce, identify and reduce waste. And what we're doing with these test runs last week was two machines. This week would have been four machines. Uh, next week, we're trying to do two speed devils, the, the, the racing sims, yeah. um, is to try and nut out and find out where the waste is. Where are wasted movements? Where is wasted human movements? Why are we looking for a glue gun when it should be here at this workstation you know um, okay so yeah so it's it's going to be for us internally it's probably going to be tricky to make the conversion but it's now really really important i see really important to do this now to improve things 
It was definitely no, an interesting I, I, dance to watch in the video with uh, just, uh, you know, it, what started out is it looking like three different people doing three different things. By about the halfway point, it, it all merged into just all hands on deck, just like going back and forth between the two machines and everything. Yeah, and that was all, and that was all very carefully. I mean, it probably didn't come over in the video, but that was all actually very carefully choreographed. Mm. Um, I had written down every person's job, what they were doing, when they were doing it, the time slot, how much time was allocated. Um, so that was a fun video to make. That the next week we'll do the four machines. That'll be good fun. And then in about three or four weeks, the intention is to try and build three pinball machines, full size pinball machines, in about three days. Okay. That would be a big test. That's going to be a big test. So yeah. Kaizen, I think it's Toyota who actually invented the Kaizen method. Um, That's I think. right. So if yeah. you think about what you're trying to do there and the sort of production line way of working, then you know you can see why it's a good thing to apply when you're building things. Yes. It even works to an extent when you're trying to do software, but it's more agile when you're talking about software. Um, but the principles still apply, you know, plan yeah, first, absolutely. make sure everything's ready to go and then start doing, you know. That's right. Yeah, that's really yeah, good. Yeah, so we're really, excited, we're really excited about that. And the uh, what we're trying to achieve as an end result is to basically make these machines faster because, you know, yeah. what's what's happened because of the pandemic and the war in Ukraine and the, the, the global logistics crisis, all of these things have come together to form a perfect storm, if you like, um, and have meant that build times for these machines have you know gone way out from where they, where they were you know, a year ago. Yeah. Um, so we're trying to bring it back. You know, that's the idea. Mm. So I noticed uh, with with your pinball machines, uh, like you said, you're making, rather than having a bazillion buttons everywhere, you're making it look much more like a standard pinball machine. Uh, I like the fact that on every single one of your machines, you're putting the little, what I call the stern button, <laughs> right there on the top of the uh, the, 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 the lock bar, yeah, um, which was a, a nice touch. Um, what are you guys going to do? And I always bring this up. Um, I've even brought it up with uh, Mel over at Zen just They've yet to make a pinball machine that requires the second flippers, but what's going to happen when you get a pinball machine that, or one of those tables that requires the second <laughs> yeah. flipper? <laughs> yeah, well, well, yeah, we can put we can put those extra buttons in. I, I, I'll find it painful. Um, I have a thing about buttons. I can't stand <laughs> having buttons all over the place. It really, I don't, I don't see the point. Um, minimalist on buttons. Yeah. So, but yeah, we can fit if if it if it comes to that, then we can. Yeah, I mean, we were. I think we were the first virtual pinball manufacturer to start using the fire button as well mm -hmm. i call it the fire button on the lockdown bar um because i could see that's obviously the way stern were going and whilst i'm not trying to copy stern yeah um it that button is very very handy you know for start and select you know, well, and and I, to perform yeah functions. and and honestly i can even see it with uh with some well i shouldn't say with some with zen tables when they're using their uh active power uh that you can you know activate in the, the thing it would make it really easy if it was mapped to that the bam you tap that and That's now right. you're starting so it's like it's a natural yeah. fit for what they're doing and i think it can be a natural fit for a lot of uh, uh machines um Definitely. I mean, even if that's what your magna save winds up being to just like slap on the top and get your magna save going you know that's right yeah and actually and, and that button on our machine does perform magna save function as well oh okay um yeah, so again, you know, I know that, you know, there are other pinball manufacturers who do put the magnet save buttons on the side by the flipper. Yeah. Um, we, we use that fire button again. How yeah. many? No, oh, good. go ahead, Jared. No, sorry. I was just going to say, no, it makes sense to put that on. I mean, let's let's be serious. Stern spends a lot of R&D on trying to find ways uh, to have their user interfaces on their machines as intuitive as possible. So, yeah. Why not? Why not look to them when you're actually trying to design interfaces for a digital pinball machine? It makes sense. That's right. Absolutely. So, in terms of uh, tactile feedback, uh, I noticed that from your entry level to your top level, everything is including nudge, analog yeah. plunger, uh, some transducers, and some solenoids. Correct. A mixture of both. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And that's. I think that's really what makes these machines come alive. I think a lot of people. Um, who you know listen this podcast may have tried uh, the Chinese mass produce models of yep. pinball shows that don't have any feedback you know yeah. and, and it, you know you may as well just be playing on your Xbox or your iPad right. um, 
But when you've got one of these virtual pinball machines with feedback, and we use a mixture of real mechanical feedback, solenoids, shaker motors, as you said, gear motors, blower fans, you know, that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. coupled with tactile feedback, it completely changes the gameplay and the machine feels alive. It completely yeah. feels alive. Um, and you would never go back once you've played a machine with mechanical feedback. You'd never go back. And again, that's the point here is that the, the idea is not just to make them, these machines look like mechanical machines, it's to make them play and feel like a mechanical machine. I want somebody to walk up, put the hands on the lockdown bar, put, put the coin in and say, you know, it feels real. It feels like a mechanical machine, and yeah. they do. I noticed, it's really important. I, I noticed that with, uh, and this is probably where the software end of things that you guys are doing is a, a, a big part. I'm sure you've noticed uh, over the past two years when both At Games and Arcade 1UP came up with their mini pins that immediately the community started modding them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> putting the first in, thing everybody does. <laughs> right? And of course, so all of a sudden it's, they're dropping in PCs, they're dropping in transducers everywhere, they're, you know, they're doing all of this stuff. And I mean, it's a lot of DIY to get it to that point. Yeah. And here you guys are taking that next logical step and it's just like, no, it's it's all in there, pre-built, pre-wired. I assume though you're you're making some custom software to make sure that this works fluidly with no issues for the uh, the end user. Yeah, there 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 is some custom software there. Um, I mean, you know, the the brains of the machine is the pin skateboard. Okay. Um, so a lot of you know uh, guys who mod these machines um, buy a small board, which is the KL twenty five Z Freedom board. Um, and the software on there is, pin, is called Pinscape. And that really is the brains of the machine. Um, and uh, back to supply chain issues, that's been one of the big problems is you can't buy the KL25Z at the moment. It's oh. out of stock everywhere else in the world. And that's the main brains of the pinball machine. That's the small circuit board that has the accelerometer. It controls the analog plunger, all of your outputs, your solenoids, and all your buttons. Right. Um, so that, that one small board is the brains of the entire machine. Um, so yes, there is some custom software that we use, um, but also most of the software is publicly available for free. Because I know, like I right. think so, fr the front end that you're using, that's a launch box, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, uh, pin up popper. Oh, pin up popper. Pin -up popper. Oh, excuse me, excuse me. Yeah. So yeah, that's okay. Yeah. So launch box we use on the arcade machines. Oh, that's what I heard it. Okay. Popper. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it's probably important though, isn't it? Because I think there are specific licensing um requirements about when you're actually using these on on machines that you've got to be quite careful of as a as a manufacturer of of digital pinballs correct yes absolutely yeah so um yeah i know that there's there are a lot of uh virtual um, pinball machine manufacturers they they're very quick to say we are not selling the software this is <laughs> yeah. just we are yeah, just offering this to make it That's easier right. for you go to use it, yeah. Yeah, and the, and the reality is that, the, you know, all of the software and all of the tables are freely available on the internet. Mm. Anybody can go on to various websites today, right now, and, and start downloading you know, various tables that are, you know, tables from the, the 50s and 60s right up to modern day tables. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're all freely available uh, for anyone to download. Um, and one of the biggest, I think one of the biggest selling points of something like, visual pinball vpx is the fact that they're pres you know we're preserving games that you know will potentially be lost in the future mm -hmm. you know tables and games that were made in you know the 1950s or, the, or even earlier you know, at some point they're not going to be in existence anymore you won't be able to buy them anymore yeah. you won't be able to play them some of these tables the cost of mechanical machines is now so high as i'm sure you know yeah, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. that it's i mean you know I do okay for myself, but owning two, three, or four mechanical machines is out of my price range. Right. I couldn't justify that. No. I can't. Um, I've got five kids to feed. I can't <laughs> justify having five pinball machines. Um, but I'd love to. I'd love to have five pinball machines. But I can do that. I can get my pinball fix digitally through mm -hmm. visual pinball. Um, yeah. And that's, that's a great thing, of course. That's great. No, it really is. Um, okay. So we've talked about um, the sort of the manufacturing side of the business. Let's talk about the actual products, I think, Chris. Yeah. So, so there's, and this is what I was pleased to see. You've got not only full-size machines, but you've actually got a three-quarter size 
um, machine as well, similar to you know the the way that Legends Pinball and IK One Up is going with their their home yeah. use cabinets, because not a, not everyone has the footprint for Absolutely. for a large machine. Absolutely. Yet, what I was really quite happy to see about this is while it's small, it doesn't seem to sacrifice specs. Like they no, that's been right. Pretty, it seems like a pretty solid unit. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's built in exactly the same. I mean, it's basically our full size machine, literally just shrunk down to, to three quarters of the size. Monitor, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost exactly the same cabinet. Uh, we're still using the metal back glass around, um, as you can see on the picture there. Mm. Um, the same metal work's just been shrunk down. Um, and the key thing is with this machine is that it was specifically designed to be at the same height at the front yes. as a full-size machine. Oh, so yeah. that when you're standing at it, you don't have to sit on a stool or on a chair or on, your, on the floor. Um, you can stand at normal height and it feels like a normal machine. That's the biggest frustration for people like me and Chris who are pretty tall. Like, you well, know. I'm not pretty tall, but I definitely have an opinion about it. Better be the right height that an actual <laughs> pinball machine is. Because yeah, <laughs> it actually, breaks a I, 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 saw, I, I saw one of the mini pinball machines about it, it, two years ago, I think, mm. and the, a friend had bought one and invited me to sit down on a little bar stool in front of it. Um, and it just looked like a toy um, mm, yeah. to me. It just, it, looked, it just looked weird and didn't feel right. Um, so, yeah. So the the specs on this one, it's um you seem to it it varies on the the specs of the machine. Obviously, you know the more money you have, the better the specs of PC. That's a pretty obvious trade off. Um, yeah. but this one seems to be sitting sort of in the the, the middling area of right. of the range. So it's Ryzen five, uh, sixteen gig RAM, terabyte SSD, uh, and then a, a six gig GPU of yes. whatever manufacturer you prefer yeah. i'd imagine or well, it's probably whatever you can get your hands on at the time well it has been yeah at the moment it's a 1660 um yep, but yep. yes pretty during the pandemic graphics cars were well like gold dust yeah yeah unobtainium as we like to say yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so okay so it's a 32 inch play field with a 24 inch back glass is that right that's correct that's right right, right. And a separate okay. DMD, right? Uh, did I see that? Correctly? Yes, yeah. that's right. So it's a total of three screens that we're actually talking about here. Correct. Which, which a lot of, this is what we see the modding community doing to things yeah. like Legends and um, and uh, One Up as well. They, they're they putting three, squeezing three screens into these. Separate things. monitors, yeah. 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 I'm actually, in, in some respects, I'm surprised that both of those manufacturers haven't actually caught on to the fact that that's what people want. No, it's a bill of materials. <laughs> they're they're we, shooting we, for a price point. Like they yeah, they want to get it to so. like eight hundred. It's, like, it's only one extra screen. It's not uh, you know it's not that expensive. Right. Yeah, I think when way. they were doing it because we we were talking with Zen during the time. You probably may have listened to some of those episodes yeah. that were concerning all the you know the physical machines because it's you know in your area. But yeah. you know they were saying that you know to there's a sweet spot for their products in particular RK okay, one up where people don't want to pay any more than an x cost but i think this is not the problem um for for you folks because people actually that's not the consideration that's not the market people are actually willing to spend the cash absolutely if they're going to get a quality product so yeah absolutely so it's the it's an interesting trip, like point where you know you're you're making a machine for a specific market versus making a machine for the market that wants to spend the money and actually yeah, I agree. not have to actually go to through the stress of actually doing it themselves yeah i agree i agree but you know if you if you want to be able to play some of the newer stern tables then you really do need the full-size dmd mm -hmm. it doesn't really mm -hmm. work on a two-screen setup you know if you have the full-size yeah. dmd appearing on the back glass which then covers up the back glass um just doesn't look right you do need that separate screen yeah absolutely if uh, somebody wanted to provide their own uh, PC, uh, is it a simple swap out with whatever you guys have in there? Uh, do you yeah. sell it without the PC? Uh, yeah, we do sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 During the pandemic, graphics cards, back to that. Yeah. Um, we were, I mean, graphics card prices were absolutely crazy. They were over double what they are now. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there was a time for about nine months where... We, we, we were mo the most common card we used was the NVIDIA 2060. Yep. And you either couldn't buy one anywhere in Australia 
or you were restricted to one card per household. Oh, jeez. And, and this is the truth. I was using friends and families' names and addresses <laughs> to buy graphics cards. Um, because a couple of times I'd, I'd gone to a supplier and ordered two cards and then immediately received a refund saying, you bought a card last week, <laughs> you oh, can't buy anymore. Um, so I was using wow. friends and families' names and addresses and having cards sent all over Australia. Yeah, like, um, I swear I'm not Bitcoin farming. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is totally. a crypto thing. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah so that was, uh, so graphics cards um were a challenge and during that time we had quite a few american customers who were who were able to get graphics cards um mm. at a reasonably decent price mm. uh, so they were basically we were building the machines and the customer was fitting their own graphics card when it arrived okay so we would set it up on our own 2060 get all the graphics drivers installed and prepped and ready and then when it arrived, the customer is installing their own 3060 or 3070. So okay. that, that happened a handful of times. Okay, great. Good to know. Um, uh, we, we've also got customers who do upgrade their own machines. You buy a machine today, as we all know, computers change in a couple of years. And we've got customers who will buy new setups and install the computers and upgrade the graphics cards themselves. So it really is designed to be all supported with commercial off-the-shelf off the shelf tech. Absolutely. You can, just, you can just upgrade it. There's no proprietary lock-in. Um, so you can buy it, buy the unit, and then it, it evolves with you as time evolves. Yeah, and it's the same as the software that, you know, we don't lock the software down. Um, some people who have had dealings with these machines may or may not know that sometimes the manufacturer locks the software so you, you can't change anything at all. Yes. Um, <clears throat> we've actually approached that differently. Um, nothing's locked down. Um, you, a customer can wipe the hard drive if they want to and completely change everything and customize it as much as they want to. Um, and I, that's, I've done that because that's what I would want. I mm -hmm. wouldn't want a machine that's locked down. Um, I like to tinker. And I think a lot of people that are into pinball like to tinker. Um, yeah, even digital pinball, they, they yeah, do. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> so, sure. yeah, it's, yeah. Um, the trade-off, of course, is the fact that if somebody makes a mistake, I've got to be here with remote support to dial in and fix the problem. So yeah. there is a there is a trade-off, um, and that does take some time. Um, however, I still think that it's a better customer experience to have unlocked software. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's let's talk about uh, this new software then that you're doing your uh, your RetroPlay App Store. <laughs> um, yeah. The, the challenges of this seem daunting to me. Are you guys? curating all of the t all of these uh tables that are available to put them in the store so there's select ones or are you just like whatever is available is going to be available in the app store how are you guys uh, uh approach yeah so this? I'm, I'm i'm literally putting the stuff together myself yeah um weekends and evenings you know, getting the tables the back glasses yeah because one of the things that one of the challenges in visual pinball and the, and the reason why there is a need for technology like this is because the table designers who are absolutely amazing at what they do, mm. the downside is that none of them subscribe to the same um, format of making the tables and, and the coding. Right. So what you end up with is 50 different tables that have all been put together with different DMD software, different back glasses, different music files, different requirements, scripts, and they often put in certain folders and named in certain ways. It's a mess. Which again yes. is literally um, why I never dipped my toes into Pinball X. Me too. I was, yeah. I think the last time, I think I messed around with VP9. I was definitely into VP8. And then VP8 was a you know a beast. And it just kept on seeming to get worse and worse as everybody started throwing in more and more. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's a real challenge. And I, and I, when I first got into visual pinball, I mean, I, it, it took, it, Honestly, it probably took me, I'd say, six to nine months of working on machines and the software just to get my head around the whole thing, mm -hmm. um, mm. and to be able to master it and understand everything. It is so tricky. And I'm, I'm, I would say I'm pretty good with computers, but even I find I found some of the things challenging. So I know from some of my customers who buy these machines, yeah. some, some of these guys are – middle-aged guys who have no computer experience at all. They just want to play. Yeah. The new, the new Batman table's out or the new you know, Medieval Madness mod table is out. They just want to play it. They don't want to spend half a day learning where to get the back glass from and what <laughs> no. file's got to be renamed this and where that's going, why that doesn't, that doesn't work and why I don't have any volume in sound, you know. Right. And yeah. 
so that that's a key thing but the one of the things for me was when i was learning myself and again i know from customers that have fed back to me on this is that sometimes the, the, the pinball community is brilliant and have massive respect for the table designers and all the guys that build the software but the community can sometimes be a bit frosty to newbies. Yes. And yes. Yeah, it absolutely can be. Sometimes, you know, you can, I see people post a basic question, you know, I've lost my DMD, I've turned my machine on, and all you get back is Google's your friend. Yeah, right. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's just not helpful. I'm sorry. I no. just don't, you know, if, if you're even going to bother to spend the time replying to somebody who's new to the hobby, yeah. just help the guy out. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just tell him. Yeah. So, yeah, so th th for me, th there's, a, there's a, a need for something like this app that will combine everything together. Um, if I, if the new, as I said, if there's a new Medieval Madness table next week, a uh, mod that requires a certain back glass with certain files and certain MP3s um, and certain settings have to be put together first, I've done all that. I've done all that myself. I put it all together. It's all pre-packaged and the customer has, as you saw in the video, a couple of clicks of the mouse and it's installed. And yeah, it's no, it, 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 was, it, it was brilliant. Uh, it, it literally made me go, okay, so if I'm eventually going to spend money on a cab, this is what, I, what I expect I now. This is what yeah. I want and you guys are the ones doing it. So, ta-da. That's right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No um, one else is doing this, are they? Like, no. it's, it's only you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the moment, yeah. At the yeah. moment, yeah. Well, uh, so so that's with working with VPX. I assume that your uh, cabs also work with Zachariah Pinball, Zen Pinball, uh, you know, the various other pinballs that you're you're able to purchase. Am I correct yeah. in that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Now, in the case of some of these, obviously their back glasses are either built into the game or like in the case of with FX3, uh, yeah, it's, it's, you got to provide your own image. We're still yeah. waiting on what's going to happen with uh, pinball effects. Um, Cause yes. obviously they they're at a freeze point with their cabs that'll happen after the console stuff comes out. So how do you adapt uh, your full, your, your cabs uh, to what I'll just call prepackaged console style uh, pinball. Yeah. So we, so the, the um, I suppose you have to understand the fact that the front end yeah. um, and the actual game are two different things, first of all. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, and that's the two different challenges is getting the game working and then getting it to work from the front end. So out of the box, when a customer buys one of our virtual pinball machines, the front end is pre-set up, ready to take uh, Zacharia and Pinball FX3 or, or two. Um, and what we say to people, I mean, I, I personally am not a massive fan of either of those um, emulators in particular. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a big fan of Visual Pinball because of all the feedback uh, and, and the realism. But if somebody wants Pinball FX3, then they sign into their own Steam account. They have to buy their own tables with Steam. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, they download and install the system. They get a cabinet code from Zen. And then I've got a small written guide on how to set it up, which takes five minutes. Or most people opt for me dialing in and setting up for them. Oh, right. Oh, okay. okay. I, I, yeah, so I can remote dial into a machine with TeamViewer, which I do often. And it takes me 10 minutes to set somebody up with FX3. So the back glass, the back glass images are already pre-installed on my machine, just sat in the background ready. Oh, okay. Nice. It so makes they're it basically just sitting there dormant, ready for someone to activate their license and uh, exactly. go about it officially. Yeah. Yeah. And exactly. the same with Zachary, I'd imagine as well. I mean, exactly. Zachary, you don't have to worry because they've got their own That's animated right. back, back glasses. glasses. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the only nice. tricky thing really with FX3 is just setting up the DMD. I mean, the, yes. the, mm. the way Pinup Popper works is that it, it actually uses the back glasses that are in the front end. So when you launch, when you look at the table in the front end, you see videos of each screen. And then when you launch the table, it launches Pinball FX3, but keeps the video back glass in place. Okay. Um, so that's always there. The only thing that somebody has to set up is the DMD, the positioning and the mm. size. So um, is, that's pretty straightforward. So is it safe to assume, though, that uh, then as things evolve, especially with Pinball uh, with with pinball effects that uh, you guys are going to adapt your software, offer download uh, to make it yeah. function once it's actually a concrete product that they uh, have pushed. 
Absolutely. Awesome. That's, that is very good. Uh, now let's talk about uh, Jared's uh, thing, which I also oh, got yeah. excited about. <laughs> Jared's thing. Yeah, yeah yes. is, this is my thing. So, you know, <laughs> well, after I've experienced, uh, you know, uh, FX2 VR and also the, the Star Wars VR, I quickly yeah. realized that, honestly, VR is the way to play digital pinball. It is such an immersive experience. And if done right... It's it's just like standing in front of a machine. But the yeah. thing that was always missing was the interface layer. It doesn't feel right getting a little controller and going yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that, right? It just breaks the illusion. It does, yeah. So enter the PinSim VR. Now, Chris, behind you, you've got your own version of this. Um, Not or currently. wherever it's, it is It's now. in the other room. <laughs> it's in the other room because it's big. Um, and so he he went and made made his own up. But yours is a bit different in that it actually has the PC built into it. Yes. And it's got a screen in the top that lets yeah, you this, the, initially... This. Look at that. Yeah, That's yeah right. look at this. That's, so, that, that impressed me once I saw that. I, 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 did, I did that because I I just could not get on with the VR desktop thing. Right? I just, oh, yeah. The, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, honestly, it took me like a week to get my head around it. I thought, I can't do this. <laughs> it's, so, it's so annoying. Yeah. Because all you need to do is just, in, in the case of, because with this product, um, if we're getting <clears throat> to, back to the space, you, you actually get a Quest 2 with it. That's right. Um, <clears throat> and the PC inside isn't isn't a, a bit of a, a slug either. It's quite yeah. beefy. Although I did have a question about the RAM, which yeah. um, surprised me. So um, I'll mention that now, and then we can go back into the the actual the experience of using this. Yeah. So the the PC in there, it's a Ryzen 7, which is a fairly decent, um, juicy spec. It's got um, uh, DDR4 RAM, but it's 8 gig. That seems low. Why? How, how are you getting the performance out of a... Um, actually, VR. I'll be honest with you, Jared. I think you've just picked up a mistake on the website. <laughs> it should actually be 16 gigs. Oh, it's 16. Oh, it that's be good. 16. Right. I was going to say, because eight, you probably wouldn't be able to run VR. Yeah, no, thank you for pointing that out. I'll, <laughs> I'll make that a change now. <laughs> yeah, well, that's good. So 16 gig, that seems good. And DDR4 is nice and fast. So that that allays any any problems I've got with that. <laughs> we, 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 recently, we recently moved our website from Wix. We had a, a basic Wix website to, to Shopify, Shopify, which you mentioned earlier on. Yeah. And unfortunately, there's no way to export all the products. So I had oh. to spend an entire weekend rewriting everything. Oh, and, wow. Um, I made some mistakes. So, yeah, it should be 16 gig of RAM. <laughs> Look, we're uh, happy to peer review the website. I do it all the time <laughs> yeah. for my job because <laughs> I'm a tech writer. So, I'll yeah. send you a machine for free. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> hey. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, that's that's a good, like, beefy spec um, yeah. for yeah. it. Um, I mean, I, the the laptop that I'm recording, the, well, that we're doing the show on now, it's a it's a 2060 RTX, yeah. um, and it does VR just fine. Um, so, and also, uh -oh. I'd imagine that because of that small screen in the in the actual cabinet, that would not take a lot of resources to run it. Actually, it's a USB monitor. It's the same monitor oh. that we use in the full size pinball machines. So right. it's USB doesn't have any implication on the graphics card at all. Wow, it does nothing. Yeah. That's so, very clever. Like yeah, so the, 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 only down, the only downside is that you don't get the BIOS screen. Um, it doesn't right. actually, the, the monitor doesn't turn on until uh, Windows boots up. Okay. So there's, there's a slight payoff there, a trade off. But um, if you needed the BIOS, you could just plug you in, could a plug monitor a monitor in the back. You does it actually, in. so it does, this is my next question because I couldn't quite see, but does the, the actual pillar actually have um, outs on the back, like outputs? Yeah. Or is it all just it, it does yeah, no, so you can out, you can one? output to you can output to a monitor um so oh. visual pinballs you may know you can output what you're seeing in vr onto another screen oh yeah yeah so i've got a few customers that have got the pin sim next to a big screen tv on the wall yes and they output the you know, what you can see onto big screen tv so other people can see what you're seeing and I'd imagine that if you can output to a um, an external <laughs> screen, this could become a base for if you just want to play um, other um, VPX titles or even if you VR want to, game. Yeah, yeah, or VR game, or if you want to actually just play arcade games on it, you could probably That's right. install what you need to do and have that output to a regular TV yeah, as absolutely. well. I think so, it's one of the biggest selling points about this product is it it's not just for pinball, 
is it, it, it can basically be a, a base station, a home base station for all VR games. If you're lucky okay. enough to have a man cave or a games room, then this can basically be your you know one stop shop for all things VR. Yeah. So what I was what good. I was trying to point out and see because uh, I was questioning. Uh, do you have uh, the USB port for the uh, connection if you're doing the uh, the the link? Uh, is that here in the yeah. front of the machine? Or? It's, it's actually underneath that red button. So it's underneath that. Yeah, that's right. Underneath okay. there. Yeah. Okay. So it's a USB C extension. Yep. Um, so with Visual Pinball, you really do need to use the link cable mm -hmm. um, right. for the Quest. Um, so yeah, it's just underneath nice. that that control deck. I was going to say because um, you know I've seen I think uh, Meta has improved the latency with their AirLink software. So I was going to ask, have you? You probably would have tried it out, but have you actually tried out AirLink um, with uh, VPX? Uh, and how does it perform? Actually, I haven't yet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I haven't had a chance to yet. Because you know the. Like some other manufacturers I've seen that are producing a product like this in Australia, they're they're doing it with a um, uh, Oculus Rift S, um, yeah. which is obviously a lot harder to set up because you've got you know it's got to be tethered to the PC. That's um, right. And I think the S is still I think they've got the virtual cameras in the headset, so you don't need to put up the the actual infrared senders on the roof, but um, it's still a big chunky headset. Yeah, yeah, I think um, the Quest Two. I think the Quest Two is a better headset. Personally, it's lighter. Mm, it's, it is. Um, I, I think that visually it's better. The visuals are better. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I personally, we, we use the Quest Two. I've actually got my. The, in fact, the, the original launch videos of this product um, showed me playing with a Rift S. I have my own Rift S. So mm. I don't really use it much. Um, but the Quest Two, I think, beats the Rift S easily. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, spec wise, it's got slightly better. Screens yeah, and field resolution. of vision. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's good. When I first, when I first set my machine up, tell you a funny story. When I first set this machine up, um, I built the cabinet first and then, then did the software afterwards. Uh, again, like Visual Pinball, complete new learning curve. Got to mm. start everything from scratch. It took me a day to get it all set up. Um, but the first experience was I was I had my headset on and I started the first game, which was Indiana Jones in, in – <sighs> Visual Pinball VR, mm -hmm. and I hadn't realized you had to set your standing position in front of the table. Oh, yes. Oh. Table, I'm, in, I'm in a room, you know, is in a um, like Egyptian tomb. I'm looking around, and I can't see the table anywhere. Like, Where is it? And it was actually above me for some reason. <laughs> and as I looked up, I know, yeah. And as I looked up, I could actually see underneath the play field all of the lamps and the lights. Uh, it was incredible. It was, I, I, I it was the f the first time in a long time where I was genuinely flummoxed about how good it looked. Jaw on the floor, it's... OMG! Literally, sort of yeah. when we got the Star Wars VR, uh, I did that because I had my my pin sim in front of me, and I looked underneath to see if there was. Yep, sure, there was a bottom, and I started going around the table to try and see how far around the table I could get until I eventually bumped into my own wall. Um, <laughs> but it was just like, man, if you have that physical object in front of you, it sells so much because your hands know, like your hands going directly to where it is immediately yeah. just locks you into that VR environment. And I found that it, it keeps you from having any kind of sense of vertigo. Um, it keeps you being able to stand there uh, longer and play it yeah. just is such a nice route uh, into that. And I'm guessing with uh, this is the same thing. I think I saw it in the specs, but um, that again, you have transducers and solenoids yeah. uh, within this cabinet. Too. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So the, so the audio and your call outs and music is directed through the headset mm -hmm. as, as mm -hmm. it would be. Um, and then the mechanical sounds are fed through the two tactile speakers. So you actually can feel and hear those mechanical sounds through the cabinet. Excellent. So you can feel the ball bouncing off the sides, you, all the knockers, so, all the solenoids kicking off. You can even feel the lamps on old tables clicking and flickering. You actually oh, feel wow. that through the side of the cabinet. Wow. So you can um, even feel down to relays energizing. Yeah, energy yeah, energizing. absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Even, even when you lose the ball and it goes down the, the, you know, the reloading mechanism, yeah. you can feel the reloading mechanism in front of you on That's the machine. Crazy. It's mind-blowing. Mind so, so good. There must be a lot 
in there to actually give you that much feedback. And it must have been a challenge to actually spatially putting the feedback into the smaller box size. Yeah. Because no you have a lot of real estate to, to move yeah. in there. And a lot of the time with the larger cabinets, you, you put transducers and stuff in different positions along the side of the cabinet to give that, that sense of yeah. distance and feeling. So that must be a challenge. Can you talk about that a little bit? Actually, the, you know, tactile transducers are not that large, in all mm. honesty. Um, the Pinsim VR has two, just two. It's a small unit. And yep. we mount those as close as possible to the flippers, so they're directly at your hands, basically. Ah, right. Um, so, yeah, they're not very, they're not large. I'm guessing the ones that I get, well, tactile transducers have been one of those uh, parts that's been tricky to get in the last few years. Yes. Can't, can't always get the same ones. But we tend to get Dayton uh, transducers where we can. And the ones that we typically use are only about, I guess, four and a half, five inches in diameter. So they're not that big, really. Mm. So it's not really a challenge fitting them in. Fitting the PC and the graphics card in is more of a challenge. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because I imagine the back of the cabinet, it, it gets quite tight where you've got the checker plate um, Very, down the back. Yeah. So it looks like it'll all be up in that sort of. Everything's top area. at the top. Everything's at the top. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. <clears throat> no, it definitely does look really slick. And it looks like you're using, like, just like all the other cabinets you've got there, you're using arcade quality equipment on there. Um, so buttons, yeah. et cetera, that's all standard across the range. And, um, and the analog plunger as well. Yeah. yeah and, of course, and, of course, the crucial thing is inside, again, is that pin skateboard that we spoke about earlier. Mm -hmm. So you've still got the ability to nudge as well. So if you're playing... You can nudge the entire unit and the ball will move with you. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, a lot of the time, like I always wonder with these smaller ones, and Chris, you could probably speak to this as well. Do you, when you're using the smaller size cabinet, is it harder to nudge because you don't have the inertia behind you when you're actually. You've got to be um, more careful you don't tip the machine over. You just literally <laughs> table foot the thing. Yeah. yeah. Chuck it. You know what, you know what Jared, what I, I honestly found uh, that I had to make the adjustment for because of I had put the pin sim board lower in the cabinet about midway mm. and therefore, but your hands are up at the top. And so then when I would slap, it wasn't quite registering. Oh. So I should have really had it mounted up higher, but I couldn't mount it much higher because I had all the cables coming on from the top of the, where all my buttons were. Um, so I had to really fudge with the sensitivity of it in order to finally right. get it to, uh, to have a nice feeling. Yeah. But the fact that I had, a wooden cabinet in front of me on steel legs, the tipping over factor wasn't an issue because it, it has weight. So that uh, wasn't actually the factor that, uh, you know, for me personally. Yeah. Oh, okay. and I mean, and the thing that you guys have built, you know, with, the, with your kick plate, therefore you can even have a foot sitting on it. But I mean, it's going to the floor. I imagine it weighs, uh, you know, it's got to weigh at least 50 pounds. Yeah, it's, it's got a bit of weight yeah. to it. I, I, I mean, I never tip, I've never tipped one over. Right. Uh, I'm quite a messy player. Um, <laughs> and the, the idea of the checker plate there, it, I mean, it does feel nice. I mean, of course, it's not the necessarily, necessarily the standing position of playing pinball, having your foot on a pedestal of any kind. Right. But it does feel really nice to play with one foot up slightly mm -hmm. on that aluminium checker plate. It feels mm -hmm. nice. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your graphics packages because I just I brought this up and I was like, hello, that's a nice graphics package right there. Um, you guys mm. doing uh, all the printing of your graphics in-house and is it really kind of uh, sky's the limit for what people can have on there? Yeah, I mean, I assume you guys are designing the, the packages? Oh, or? Yeah, I mean, a lot, a lot of the customers design their own um, vinyls and things, you know, and send in that, that particular machine you just Featured there yeah. was an example of a customer who, you know, who supplied us with the, the graphics um, and we just have it printed locally. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. But imagine that from what I've seen, there's like a set. You can have like really loud graphics on there or you can have stuff that's a little bit more subdued. Um, uh, Everyone's got on... different tastes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've got a library yeah. that people can select from, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's really is it's only really limited by somebody's imagination yeah yeah absolutely yeah oh that's good that's awesome um uh where I, do you guys uh see yourselves going from here with this uh with your pin cabs um what do you see kind of uh tumbling down the pike as the trend goes because i mean what we've noticed is that 
digital pinball seems to be on a very much on the upswing. Um, people are really getting yeah, into right. it and, and doing all this stuff. And whenever that happens, obviously changes are going to start coming in swift. So I'm just curious, curious uh, your take on the market, where you see things going or what you would like to see uh, coming yeah, into these machines. There's some very, very big changes that are happening. Um, there are currently two forks of visual pinball that have been developed by two different teams of people. One is using the Unreal Engine, <clears throat> um, and there's another fork using Unity. Uh, sc- sorry, I've got a frog in my throat. Yeah, no worries. <clears throat> throat> um, the Unity version looks really good. The Unreal Engine 5 version is mind blowing <laughs> the, the graphics if you think the uh, if you think the graphics look good on visual pinball uh, i mean you know visual pinball looks amazing running on a 4k monitor you know at 144 hertz yeah it's brilliant but when you see unreal engine footage of visual pinball it will blow your mind the detail the physics are incredible we Absolutely. don't doubt it. i mean when we saw the demo <laughs> for unreal 5 my mind immediately yeah. went to, oh my God, what this can do for yeah. pinball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, think... so the future, the future definitely is using a dedicated game engine. Uh, a lot of the table developers are already you know, talking about that. And as I say, there are two active forks of visual pinball. Interesting. Um, it is the so... beta and VHS of visual pinball. Who is yeah, going to win? I think maybe. I've got an idea who's going to win uh, um, based on how many, uh, uh, how many redundancies I've seen with uh, Unity recently? Yeah, yeah. So Absolutely. I think Unreal is what I'd be backing if I was. Well, be I mean, it. the technology that they have in the engine now, you know, uh, with, the, with the new, you know, the, the lighting engine and the ray just, tracing and stuff. Yeah, is just it's, it's, out of it's this world. incredible. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. The visuals look stunning. The physics are brilliant um, with Unreal Engine, um, but I think that you know, I released a video a few months ago, um, you know, about the idea of having a meta arcade, you know, how about having an arcade in the metaverse, you know, this is mm-hmm. mm. technology that's been developed right now and um, whether or not you're on board with it completely. And I know that there'll be a lot of people who'll be thinking it's all crap. You know, it's never going to happen. Oh, it will you know, happen. <laughs> our, our friend, Mr. Zuckerberg is investing tens of billions of dollars yeah. along with Nvidia and Google and Microsoft. So yeah, the metaverse or something like the metaverse is going to happen. And I think that, I think the pinball needs to it needs to stand up and say, I want to be part of that technology. I want to be there. Mm. I want to find I mean one of the greatest things that FX3 has achieved is it brought a younger audience to pinball. Right. Yes. Younger people are experiencing pinball for the first time. Yeah. Um, and the metaverse and those technologies have the same opportunity to bring in a whole new audience and a whole new experience. And as we've said, you know, the VR is the VR pinball is really, really good. It's mm. only going to get better only going to get better yeah we really are at the at just the beginning of what vr pinball is all about at the moment i i know that for sure and i i tend to agree i think um if imagine the possibilities of what you could do in in a virtual space with an arcade it could be the most extravagant arcade you've ever seen in your life with no limitations yeah that's right and you know, there, there's got to be. You just got to work out how to monetize it. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> we, 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 we've already, you know, we already registered the domain name, the Metaverse Arcade. And, oh, there you go. <laughs> a few months ago, we've all, we, have, we, we've already started a business plan to start putting together the technologies. I'm not a game developer. I don't have yeah. the skills, the experience yeah. myself, but I'd like to be involved in. You know, putting together a team of people that can work on a metaverse style arcade, and one of the ideas I had, which I I, I, I think it'd be great, would be to have a blank pinball machine. So, uh, so to actually buy a retro play full size virtual pinball machine in your house, mm-hmm. yeah, have no artwork on it, mm-hmm. yeah, um, so it'd be completely blank, and you put your VR headset on, enter the meta arcade. And then what you'll be able to do is download graphics packs so that when you look at your machine through your VR augmented reality, oh, yeah. you'll be able to see the Godzilla artwork or the Beatles or whatever else, you know. Oh, that'd be yeah. crazy. Actually on the outside that of your machine. So yeah. And then to actually customize the play field as well. So actually to have an experience where you, in augmented reality, so you'll be able to see your furniture around you in your room and your family. But when you look at your pinball machine, it will look completely different. 
and you'll be able to actually choose elements on the play field, pick up a pop bumper, move it, change the flippers, change some lighting, actually do that in augmented reality on your machine. I think that's the future. So designing pinball in VR. It's... I like where your head's at. <laughs> yeah. <Probably not. laughs> yeah, this sounds I great. Cool. I think it'd be amazing. That's yeah. awesome. Um, before we let you go, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about this because this is the other thing that grabbed my attention. Uh, as a uh, former huge fan of all things uh, rock band and guitar hero, um, I'm sorry, you have uh, 9,000 songs available on your cab? <laughs> love that machine. Love that, that machine so much. We're selling more of the guitar pros right now than we're, than we're selling of any other machine. I'm not surprised. <laughs> like, I am. I am. Honestly, I am. I, it was never really a thing in my childhood. Okay. And it well, was actually one of my guys that works for me who had the idea of bringing it back. And I was like, I don't know, really? Didn't it die at death? <laughs> didn't didn't it just stop and everyone, you know, stop playing it? Um, but it's great. It's so good. But yeah, 9,000 tracks. Okay. <laughs> it's just it was like, that's even... two and a half grand or something, isn't it? Two and a half. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man. Brilliant machine. Yeah, wow. that thing is an absolute beast. And I love the fact you've got like really good quality guitar controls on them. Those ones that you, you, you ship the with the game, yeah. they're solid units. Yeah, so again, it's a learning experience. You know, it's new technology. I'd never used them before. I started off with wireless controllers and they kept dropping out. No, latency of those is rubbish. Latency go is USB. awful. And I thought, oh, this is never going to work. And then somebody said, you know, have you thought about using the Rafnet adapter? Uh, so I reached out to, to Raphael at Rafnet and... We're now using those in the machines, and we're now their actual official supplier in Australia as well. Which is mm. really cool. Yeah, I saw that. Wow. That makes a big difference. So you'll see behind me, I've got a drum kit, right? Ah, yes. So that thing there, I play a bit of software called DTX Mania. Yeah. And it's like Guitar Hero, um, but for drums. For drums. And yeah. it's based on the Konami Drum Mania and Gitadora series. Um, now, I know that you've got... Um, because it's a PC inside, there's nothing yes. stopping me getting that probably installed Absolutely. on that box. Absolutely. And that becomes the the tower. Because if you have a look online, you'll see how the Drum Mania um, and Gitadora kits look. They look amazing. Yeah. Um, and I, that's what I was thinking of like as an application for that. I could just plug the, the drum kit through USB into that. Yep. And the screen would be at around the right height if you're seated at a drum kit. Yeah. Um, and off you go. So I, I I think you've got Drum Hero on there as a we, mod. Yeah, we have. Yeah, so uh, Phase Shift and Drum Hero will both use the drums, and there are about, I'm guessing, a couple of thousand tracks that will use the the drums. Oh, uh, right. To select either, yeah, you, know, you can select either bass guitar, lead guitar, vocals, or drums. Oh, this is through Guitar Hero itself. So yeah. as, as long as you've got a, a an e kit. Is it any e-kit that'll work on yes. there? Yes, anything USB. Anything USB that has anything been USB, in, I'd imagine. It will be recognized by Windows, and it's just a case of setting the controls up, you know, that's telling the software fair. what drum does what. <laughs> that's very good. Because I noticed yeah, uh, you also mentioned uh, uh, DJ Hero, which I also loved. And I was just like, oh, <laughs> there was just like a swing-out table to put your your, your pad on. Oh, yeah. So you could just like <laughs> not have to provide a separate table for that and be able to stand up and do that. That would be like, bang on. But I actually haven't tried DJ Hero myself yet. That's oh. on the to-do list, yeah. Have you, you got know, the deck for it? The, Sorry? Have you got the DJ Hero deck controller? Yes. No, 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 I haven't. No, no, not yet. Okay. I think no. they're a little bit hard to come by. So uh... We need to do that. In fact, it's only on Friday. We're just finishing off a batch of five machines. And two of the guys that work for me um, are great guys. And they every lunchtime, they play Guitar Hero. <laughs> and one of the guys mentioned to me, he said, have you thought about doing a SingStar machine? Oh, my and gosh. I was like, what's that? <laughs> He said, yeah. well, basically the same machine, yeah. but, but with rather mics. than the guitars, have mics. Right, yeah. And again, I was like, is that even a thing, really? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a thing. So we started looking into that on Friday afternoon, and yeah, it's a thing. It really is a thing. So yeah. we'll be releasing, it looks like a SingStar machine. Wow, there <laughs> to, you go. So yeah, you I like how adaptable band. you guys are being with uh, just like, I mean, obviously, again, because you're doing all the manufacturing as much as you can, I should say, there in Australia – yeah, an idea pops up. It's like, well, we can try and see where it goes from yeah. there. You know, it's yeah, it, it, and we are like that. Absolutely, I'm more than happy to listen to ideas and try new things out. You know, we're trying out a dance mat. We're going to try and manufacture our own DDR dance mat. Mm, yeah, um, we've, we've built we've built a um a, a like a an early sort of demo version. It works. Um, 
So maybe within six to nine months, we'll have our own you know, metal framed DDR pad. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, good it's like to try 2005 all over again. <laughs> it is. It's what we. It's what I want. I want to see. A, I want to have a DDR. You won't be seeing me have... dance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know those things. You can buy the the actual metal mats now. I yeah. think and get them into in Australian dollars for about one and a half grand. So having yeah. a local manufacturer of those. Would I've got two good. full-size plexi ones in my closet that the controllers yeah. no longer work anymore, or they, the yeah, pads cracked. Yeah, because of the dodgy stuff, leaf switches. Yeah, it was fun for a while. <laughs> yeah, you can buy those cheap mats that are from Amazon for about 100 bucks. Yeah, yeah that they're, last they're, literally like, a day. Yeah, that's yeah, the until, problem. Yeah, 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 pretty much. Brain goes in them. There's yeah. a manufacturer of the dance pads in Poland. Um, I can't remember their name now, but they are. they seem to be the guys at the moment who are manufacturing um, sort of industry standard dance pads. Hmm. Um, again, I'm not quite sure how big the market is. I'm not. I'm not yeah. sure. You know, is there a demand for DDR? Yeah, there's I a mean, massive I, open source scene for Step Mania. That's right, Step Mania. Yeah. Open source scene, just like there is for DTX Mania. Like, there's a whole community, like VPX, Guitar Hero. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Guitar Hero well, and, then, and DTX Mania. And this is what cracks us up: is that all these games back then that we got started with, a lot of them, Red Octane was the the company making yeah. the peripherals for. Which is where Mel Kirk was <laughs> before yeah. going over to Zen. So it's like it's just kind of funny how people are yeah, going from that little thing growing, and then everything is coming back in because they're like, "Well, hey, we really liked it. Let's throw it back into the mix," <laughs> you know. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's awesome. But these these communities, is like... as we've proven that, you know, these communities are still alive and kicking. And yep. when I first started looking into the Guitar Hero stuff back in the early days of researching, started looking at YouTube videos. Yeah, and there's guys on YouTube with like four or five million views yeah. in the first yeah. three or four weeks playing Guitar Hero or Clone Hero. You know, and I'm like, that's mad. That's a lot of views. Yeah, <laughs> it's it really a lot. Is. It really yeah. is. Some of them are so good. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, hey, yeah. uh, folks, if you're looking to uh, uh, research this stuff further a little bit more, uh, checking it out for yourself, go to uh, retro-play.com.au. Um, their full store is up there. Uh, you can check out everything. The, you guys also have a whole mess of videos on YouTube. Um, I know I've been uh, searching them out and uh, watching them, kind of educating myself a little bit about what you guys. Um, I think you guys have your head in the right spot, and uh, Thank you. things sure. are looking really good. Thank you very much. All right, That's so everybody, good. that was uh, David Gilmore from uh, Retro Play. Uh, I guess next time, Jared, we'll maybe play some pinball. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we might have a flip. Next time around, do, and, do a play. I mean, if, if we're not having a flip, we're doing what? Oh, we're talking about stuff and things, our favorite stuff and things, folks. All right, until then, uh, thank you once more, David, and we'll see you guys uh, next time. Bye bye. See you later. Thank you.